Thank God it's Friday, Eastern Football League lovers, and welcome to another edition of the Friday Preview. We love it at this time on a Friday to give you all those important teams and selections as you go local for your football tomorrow afternoon. 22 great games across all four divisions. Well, let's introduce the panel members then, and we're going to start with the man that will hear across the airwaves all afternoon tomorrow as he produces EFL Game Day, Damien Watson. Good afternoon to you, mate. Uh, pleasure to be here, BWS. Looking forward to an interesting Intriguing weekend of local footy. Intriguing it might be. It might also be straightforward as well. Yeah, I guess it could be. (laughs) Oh, mate, it's it's great to have you on board. And a man who's always on board, whether it be a Wednesday, a Friday, a Sunday, a Saturday, is Ray Baird, and he's coming to EFL House today. G'day, mate. Uh, Good afternoon, BWS. And it's just great to see these other two young up-and-comers getting a a go on the Friday preview. Speaking of up-and-comers, Mitchell Wood joins us today for another edition of the Friday preview. How are you, mate? Very good, thanks, BWS. Great to be here once again. Really looking forward to discussing all the games uh, tomorrow. Let's get stuck into it, shall we then, gentlemen? Of course, the Friday preview is brought to you by Inside Football, the must-read for the fair Dinkum footy fan. Get it as that magazine or get it on your iPhone or on your iPad. First game we're going to have a look at in Division 4 is straight on to you, Ray Baird. Second place, Ferntree Gully take on the bottom of the ladder, Canterbury Football Club. This looks like it'll be one-way traffic. I think you're reading my notes because I've got down here second place, Ferntree Gully, there at home tomorrow <laughs> against bottom of the ladder, Canterbury. Look, Ferntree Gully last week, they had a real shocker against South Belgrave. Look, it's a game that uh, probably best forgotten by the Eagles. Look, their form in the first eight weeks was very good and I believe that they have to focus on that early season form. Their captain, Paul Giannopoulos, leads from the front and Ben Rawlings, Josh Wicks, and Paul Hager. They've been very prominent up forward for the Eagles, but tomorrow they're up against Canterbury, who are only averaging eight goals a game. Look, last week, Shelley Fulton, uh, Innes McPhail, and Stuart Blackham, they were very good for Canterbury, while Ryan Smith and Brett Johnson were serviceable. Look, Coach Ange Lamana knows that his side is in a work in progress, and he's trying to build a foundation for the future. But look, tomorrow, look, Funchy Gully, they're just going to be too good. The Eagles by 40. Only 40, right? Yeah, only 40. Okay, let's move it along to the second game, Mitch. Uh, Kilsyth take on Nutter Wadding. So third versus 10th, another one-sided affair, you might think. Yeah, I'd most likely say so. Uh, Nutter Wadding, they have a very huge or a massive challenge, should I say, ahead of them when they face Kilsyth at Pink's Reserve. Despite being 10th on the ladder, the Lions will go into this game with a lot of confidence after celebrating their first win last week over Surrey Park by three goals. On the other hand, the Cougars suffered their second loss of the season to Sylvan by 40 points. They still sit in third place, though, and are heavily back favourites to win this game. Kilsai spearhead forward Jay Sherlock will be hoping to return to his exceptional form that he produced in the first few games. He's also leading the goal-kicking in Division 4 with 39 goals, but has only kicked three goals in the past two weeks. The younger players of the Cougars, including Jamie Haig, Cameron MacArthur, Corey Subin and Harley Thomas, have shown a great deal of potential this season, and we'll be hoping to continue their consistent form. Nutter Wadding, they'll need an all-round team effort if they want to defeat Kilsyth tomorrow, and a lot is expected from Robert Papp and Tom Denon, who was named best of field in the Surrey Park win. I believe that the Lions will be gallant, but the Cougars should bounce back from the disappointment of last week with a comfortable victory. Expect a close game to be out at Domini Reserve tomorrow afternoon, Damian Watson, with the Park Orchard Sharks taking on the Eastern Lions. Yeah, an interesting game beckons for both clubs, BWS. Only a game separates Park Orchards and the Eastern Lions on the Division 4 table, and as we pass the halfway mark of the season, victories will become increasingly more valuable. And this is an integral match for the young Sharks, who must prevail to maintain any hope of reaching the finals in 2013. You would suspect that they would be favourites as the group will be immensely refreshed following a two-week break as it turned out and I feel that the team would have been rejuvenated entering their bye with a hard fought and thrilling three-point victory over Nutter Wadding a few weeks ago. The Fahir brothers exerted their influence on that game and must do likewise tomorrow if the Sharks are going to gain a comprehensive victory. Sam Fraser up four coming off a four-goal game and Troy Walkley are other Park Orchards players that could be damaging tomorrow. As for the Lions, they've had a 
a forgettable first half of the year. However, confidence would surely be instilled within the team after claiming their second scalp in 2013 with a five-goal victory over Cellar Dwellers Canterbury last week. And with serviceable players such as Rod Church and the potent forward target Elvis Alamovsky, who is fresh off an eight-goal performance, don't discount or underestimate the Eastern Lions' chances tomorrow. However, I feel that the youthful Sharks will have the superior pace and polish to reign supreme in front of their home crowd at Domini Reserve tomorrow. You going to give us a margin for this game? I'd say probably three goals to the Sharks. Sylvan taking on South Belgrave in the match of the round for Division 4 Ray out at Sylvan Recreation Reserve. What a game this this shapes to be. Sylvan coming off uh, a massive win last week, as were the Saints. Yeah, look, at the last time these two sides met, B, uh, met BWS, it was in round two at South Belgrave. Look, and then the Saints belted Sylvan to the tone of 76 points on that occasion. But look, I believe that things have changed since then, and Sylvan will put up a much better account of themselves tomorrow. Look, their, their two losses to the top two sides, South Belgrave and Furniture Gully, were severe, but they've also handed out some thrashings to the bottom side. Tomorrow they have a chance to redeem themselves and take a big scalp. Patrick Rackray has been a revelation since coming down from the Yarra Valley Mountain District Football League with 30 goals thus far, and he's given them a target up forward. And 300-plus gamer Mark Cullen, look, he's found a new lease of life, and he's really carving them up around the stoppages. South Belgrave, on the other hand, were awesome last week and demolished second-place Ferntree Gully to the tune of 63 points. And their big three, Odomat, Bacons and Apps, they controlled the game last week. And uh, Alex Bembo and John Hurton, look, they were in and under everything. Then for the first time this season, South Belgrave last week, they jumped out of the blocks. And if Sylvan can control the early part of this game tomorrow, they have a huge chance of winning. This, I believe, will be the closest game in all divisions. And because of their home ground advantage, I'm going to select Sylvan to get over the line in a nail by two points. You're going against the Saints. I am. Fifth and final game, Mitchell Wood. This is going to be a very good clash too, you would expect. A very important game for two sides. Forest Hill taking on Surrey Park, both coming off a loss last week, both trying to get into the finals. Yes, indeed. As you said, both teams, they'll desperately want the win after coming uh, or coming so close to getting a win last week. Forest Hill, they went down to Coldstream in a pretty tight contest. Meanwhile, Surrey Park were expected to defeat the winless Nutter Wadding at home, but only produced one quarter of football in the 18-point loss. Big games will be needed from uh, Brenton King Cotter, Ash Nolte and Jake Rowe. They'll all need to step up for the Zebras if they want to win this vital game. The Panthers, they are um, not to be underestimated, though. Aside from last week's effort, they have been respectable in most games and deserve to be in contention for that fifth place. Luke Conker is continuing his fine form through the midfield and he's quite handy in front of goals with 17 to his name this season. Also having commendable seasons are Seamus Herrick, Daniel Morris and Ben Walker. I think the home ground advantage should be enough for Forest Hill as they continue their march towards the finals. Five great venues for five great games as you go local for your football in Division 4 tomorrow. We hope your team wins. It's Division 3 time, gentlemen, and of course, as Division 4, 2 and 1 are, this segment is brought to you by Inside Football, the Fair Dinkum Reed for the, well, the Fair Dinkum, the must read for the Fair Dinkum footy fan. You spit that one out, Peter. Well, I eventually did, didn't (laughs) didn't I, mate? It's a a quality read. I like to do it in the magazine form, as does yourself, but some of these younger boys like Damo and Mitch, they like to have the app on their Mm. iPhones and tablets. But let's get stuck into the game, shall we? Straight up to you, Damo. Whitehorse taking on Mitchum. This is first versus 12th. Another one of those games which might be a one-sided affair. Yeah, unfortunately, I feel this will be a lopsided encounter at Springfield Park, so I agree with you, BWS. Mitchum will be fired up and eager to redeem themselves following a disappointing display last week in which they suffered a 15-point defeat at the hands of Doncaster in the the top-of-the-table clash, and that margin was flattering because if it had not been for the increase in intensity and scoring in the final term by the Tigers, the loss would have been significantly greater. Tomorrow, Tigers forward Steve Pym will be itching to atone for his performance last round. 
in which he was held to just two majors following great negation by the Doncaster defenders. As for the hapless and luckless pioneers, they would take some solace and morale out of their gallant effort against Heathmont last week, in which they only fell on the wrong side of a frilling ledger by five points. Whitehorse players and Edward Sim, Aaron Mates and Aidan Kerrin have provided some spark this year for the Pioneers and they'll be crucial to the team's ambitions tomorrow. But I feel that the Whitehorse Pioneers struggle to find a key and consistent avenue to goal. We'll go against them and detriment them and I believe that'll be exploited tomorrow and I predict that Mitchum will return to the winners list with a desire for redemption tomorrow afternoon and will maintain their top spot while compounding on the Pioneers winless year thus far. Now Ray this game is huge out at Tormore Reserve tomorrow. Baronia taking on Heathmont fifth versus seventh. It's really an eight point game isn't it? It certainly is. You're dead right there. Baronia fifth. They're at home tomorrow. They can take on Heathmont in seventh spot. Look, it's a game that Baronia must win if they want to stay in touch with that uh, fifth spot on the ladder. But the problem with Baronia is that they're only averaging 12 goals a game. And to match it with the top four side, they need to extend that tally. But they are a side also that are able to restrict the opposition to low scores. And I feel that that's a legacy of Mark Hardy's style of coaching. Pat Garrity and Shannon Bainbridge have been good, but I feel they need to get more out of Dean Grice and Mark Williams, who are two proven match winners. Heathmont coach Steve Buckle, he's done a great job with that young side this season. And uh, Captain Dylan Swerns is leading the way. And the Nudson brothers, John and Alistair, along with Dave Sundry, they, they've been very prominent all season. Last week, they only just got over the line against bottom side Whitehorse Pioneers. And I believe that Baronia have the better form at the moment going into this game. And Baronia will get the points, Hawks by 35. Glen Waverley Hawks take on Doncaster. All host Doncaster tomorrow out at Central Reserve. The Hawks led it three quarter time last week, Mitch, and really let it when it let, let a game go that they otherwise would have liked to have won. Well, they probably should have won. Doncaster top of the table clash against Mitchum. They got that win. Now they're the ones to beat. Most definitely, they're enjoying a stellar year uh, thus far. But their opposition in the Glen Waverley Hawks it's the, it's the exact opposite, and they're really battling at the moment. The Sharks sit in second place and are in are on equal points with Mitchum, who have a slightly better percentage. The two front riders played off last week at Scrams Reserved, in which Doncaster were strong enough to win by 15 points. The horror year for the Glen Waverley Hawks continued, as you said, against the Basin, as they squandered a 15-point lead at three-quarter time and conceded six goals in the last to lose by 16 points. This was their seventh loss for the season and all but ruled out any hope of playing in the finals this year. This is a massive test for the Glen Waverley Hawks, and they'll be hoping to win some... Respect back by defeating a quality opposition in Doncaster. In order to do so, they cannot afford to drop off and must maintain a high level of intensity for the whole four quarters. Doncaster will be hoping to limit the influence of Anthony Wallenberg, who has been named in the best on five occasions for the Glen Waverley Hawks. The Sharks midfield is close to one of the best in the competition, with Aaron Fiora leading the way in recent weeks. It's hard to tip against Doncaster though, especially after last week's victory over a formidable Tigers outfit. Jubilee Park is the venue tomorrow as the Basin, the Basin, the Basin, what am I trying to say here? Hmm. Ringwood take on the Basin. I'll just spit it out, shall I? Damien Watson tomorrow in an interesting clash. The Redbacks got over the line against the Bears earlier on in the year and they've won two in a row, so a little bit on a roll, you might say. Well, that's right. This has the makings of an intriguing clash. And I said last week that Ringwood needed to defeat Templestowe to revive their season and they maintained their composure in a tense contest to do just that. And that win away from home will undoubtedly galvanise the Ringwood group. But in reality, James Katsiavos is their only major source, source rather, of goal-scoring venom for the Redbacks. And that was exemplified on the weekend with an impressive 10-goal performance. And to say that he was the difference would be the understatement of the millennium. He's a player that the Bears defenders must quell if they're to account for Ringwood tomorrow. And speaking of the Basin, a victory at Jubilee Park tomorrow is immensely integral to their efforts in maintaining their spot within in the top four with Baronia on their hammer on the ladder. A six goal to one final term by the Bears was enough to salvage a 16 point win over the Glen Waverley Hawks last weekend. Players such as Michael Oxley, Josh Adams and William Gafer were prominent for the Basin and will need to replicate those performances tomorrow. I feel that the Bears can halt the Redbacks temporary rush of momentum and dent their finals hopes tomorrow afternoon. Margin? Probably in a thriller by a goal. 
Juan Turner South take on Templestow out at Walker Reserve. Ray, Juan Turner South sitting in third position. Templestow have dropped off form in the recent weeks. They find themselves in sixth spot. Where do you see this game going? Yeah, look, this is a game that the Dockers, uh, they, they need to win if they want to stay in touch with the top five. Look, the, both these sides last met in the radio game in round three, which resulted in a three-point win to the Dockers. So, look, Juan Turner South, they'll be all out to avenge that defeat. But, look, Templestowe's form hasn't been that impressive. They've struggled to put away teams that were lingering at the bottom of the ladder, but they also are a side that rely heavily on Simon Grasser, Jamie Brain and Michael McCallum to kick all their scores. Whereas one Turner South, on the other hand, they're a side full of confidence at the moment, defeating Churnside Park by 65 last week with Tager Leck at 6, Brett Walker 3 and Phillips and Badone 2. They were all amongst the goals. And the return of Brett Hutchinson to the, and the leadership of Andrew Teekle brings a smile to the face of Matt Clark. Clark. I feel that the confines of Walker Park will choke the Dockers, and I predict a la a huge win to the Devils, fifty plus points. Walker Reserve, it is, mate, not Walker Park. Walker Reserve. Oh, that's right. We can't talk about the G, can we? Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think Templestowe might cause a bit of an upset. They've proven against the, uh, some good sides already this year that they're up for the challenge. Yes, they've been in some bad form. Have they come back from the break uh, good enough? Last week's. Uh, well, I go last week's result would suggest no against Ringwood, but who knows? They, I think they could be up for a bit of a challenge here. I just think that uh, the Devils are on fire at the moment. You look at their results over the last few weeks, they're really on fire. Well, head out to Walker Reserve tomorrow if you want to check out that clash. The sixth game we're going to have a look at, and the final one, in fact, is Warrandyte taking on at Churnside Park. Mitch, it's 11th versus 10th. Could be a close one, this one. Warrandyte and Churnside Park have struggled to register wins this season with both sides only singing their club song twice. Uh, they played each other in round one and the Bloods pulled off a remarkable 10-point victory away from home. Warrandyte have since gone on to win one game, which came against the winless Whitehorse Pioneers in round seven. It's been a similar story for the Panthers and despite being competitive in a number of games this season, they have only defeated the Pioneers and the Glen Waverley Hawks in fairly unconvincing fashion. Both teams experienced large defeats last week and will be eager to get the four points and move out of the relegation zone. The Battle of the Rucks should be a beauty with Dave Hand of the Bloods up against the big pets Aaron Pantanella. Vital to Warrenite's cause will be Daniel Large along with Luke Dunn around the goals. It's great to see that Churnside Park coach Lee Horsburgh is playing several of the club's younger players including Michael Baldwin, Tim Gover and Regan Grimwood. The Bloods and the Panthers have a habit of playing in close contests when they come up against each other. I expect nothing less this time round, with Churnside prevailing in a tight affair. Six great games as you go local for your football across Division 3 tomorrow. We hope your team wins and you have a great day watching Australia's greatest game. It's Division 2 time, gentlemen, brought to you by Inside Football, the must-read for the Fair Dinkum footy fan. Damien Watson, you'll kick us off in this division. North Ringwood taking on Upper Ferntree Gully getting some what, what might seem some lopsided games this afternoon. Yeah, that's right. And, but newfound confidence has crept into the upper gully side, it must be said. And if a wet afternoon is forecast tomorrow, the inclement conditions may conditions rather may actually suit them. Upper Ferntree Gully appeared to thrive in the low scoring slog last week in their breakthrough five point victory over Bulgrave in an encounter where only nine goals were converted between the sides and it was promising to witness Tate Hickleton boot three majors for the game as the side have been bereft of regular and consistent goal, kick- goal kickers as has been widely publicised. All of a sudden Upper Gully are within percentage reach of the two teams above them and they have the incentive now to emerge from from relegation territory. However, North Ringwood will be eager to make amends for a 10-point loss to Croydon last week, and the Saints' key players in Jake Gibson, James Dean and goal kicker Tommy Hill will be difficult to thwart. I believe that the Saints can thrust Upper Ferntree Gully back into reality with a comprehensive victory at Quamby Reserve tomorrow in excess perhaps of 10 goals, BWS. 10 goals, big margin here. It is. Okay, Croydon. Well, haven't they? Well, they haven't come from nowhere, but they've slipped themselves very nicely up into second position, Ray, and they take on the Waverley Blues tomorrow. Yeah, the Battle of the Blues at Croydon Recreation Reserve tomorrow. Look, uh, second place Croydon take on seventh place Waverley Blues. And look, uh, Croydon, they're full of confidence at the moment that after defeating uh, North Ringwood by 10 points last week and leading all through that game. 
at, uh, at the relegation side from Division 1 last year, they're just building momentum as the year progresses. And that spring in the step has certainly returned to Croydon. And they'll be hard to beat tomorrow. Paul Newman has a side that he will, can swap players from back to forward and the luxury of two big ruckmen in, in Tim Green and Will Gordon. Add to that Brendan Wiernert, whether he plays forward or back, makes no difference. He's good at either end. And Brett Davidson, boys, they've been a little flat over the last fortnight after notching three wins on the trot rounds five to seven so they'll need to work harder and get back on the win- on the winners list a disappointing loss to Doncaster East last week a side around the same mark and one that I predicted that they would have won they, they certainly lost that one Robbie Hartfield Paul Savage Ryan Tiley and John Heinsohn they're all ever reliable and they'll have to bring their best to the table tomorrow but Croydon have their eye on that top two spot and they're not going to drop this game for no reason Croydon by 30 by me Montrose versus Murrubark in match of the round in Division 2 tomorrow out at Montrose. Mitch, this is sure to be a cracker. Both sides in very good form. Yeah, most definitely. As you said, it is the game of the round tomorrow in Division 2 with ladder leader Montrose hosting the fourth place Mustangs. Both sides were successful last week, particularly the Mustangs who obliterated Donvale by 76 points. For Montrose, they did enough to hold off a brave Bayswater side by three goals. Moorbark were embarrassed when they last met with the Devils in round two. Despite trailing at half-time by nine points, the Mustangs could only pile on two goals and allowed Montrose to kick 13 in the 83-point loss. It is clear that Moorbark are missing the presence of Kier Tulevesky in the forward line. In saying that, though, Chris Murphy has been serviceable and the bulk of their midfielders are featuring, featuring in the goals on a weekly basis. None more so than the club's favourite son in Matthew Polkinghorn. He has kicked four goals in the past two games and continues to give it his absolute all. The Devils' side is strong across the board and full of talent. With Matt Langdon down back, Brett Johnson's experience through the midfield and Billy Schilling as the leading forward, the Mustangs will certainly have their hands full come tomorrow afternoon. Moorbark have regained a fair amount of confidence in recent weeks, but it's very hard to go past Montrose at home, and I expect them to make it a staggering 10 consecutive wins. Got a margin for us? I reckon around the four to five mark. Very good. Fifth versus sixth out at Donvale Reserve. Local rivals go at it again. Damien Watson, we called this game on Anzac Day during Mm. the year, and Donvale got the points that day. Who's going to get the points tomorrow? Well, there will be high anticipation and excitement surrounding this game because both sides are in a very similar position with a point to prove BWS and Donvale desperately need to regain some form on their home turf at Donvale Reserve tomorrow afternoon following a 76-point shellacking at the hands of Murrelbark last week, a team which is only one spot ahead of them on the table and if they want to salvage any hope of a top-four finish this season, a win is essential in this game for the Vales. Players like David DiStefano, Chris Jones and renowned goal kicker Nicholas Murphy will have to be in peak form this weekend if Donvale are to prevail. As for Doncaster East, your boys at BWS, confidence will be permeating throughout the side after their gritty and hard-fought 13-point victory over the Waverley Blues, which has really reignited the Lions' season. Doncaster East figures of the calibre of Lee Murphy, Nathan Mill and Ashley Neville, and of course that live wire Carl Peterson, will have to continue their impressive recent form if they're going to sing the theme song tomorrow. However, I feel that this will be a sluggish and highly physical contest, similar to when these clubs last met on Anzac Day, as you mentioned, and I feel that we'll witness the same result in a narrow Domvale win. Well, I feel that we'll witness the opposite result with a narrow Doncaster East win. Yeah, because you're very impartial, BWS. You're the one that labelled them my side. (laughs) No one ever said that they were my side, but uh, it should be a good game nonetheless. It usually is, Ray. Yeah, no, look, uh, you've never mentioned them as your side. Okay. Never, no. It's usually by you or Damo or Peter or nonetheless. Let's keep the ball moving because the fifth and final game in Division 2, Mulgrave and Bayswater, two sides that opened the season under lights at Bayswater Oval earlier this year. Ray and uh, they're in ninth and eighth now. How do you see this one going? Yeah, look, uh, Mulgrave, they host uh, the Waters tomorrow at uh, Mulgrave Reserve, and I imagine it'd be a very damp Mulgrave Reserve with the rain we've had earlier in the week. Look, this game is huge in the relegation stakes, as both are sitting two wins, seven losses, along with Upper Fern Tree Gully. And when they met, as you said, in round one in the night match, uh, Mulgrave prevailed by 37 points. 
Bayswater's form, it's hard to follow. Last week they were very good up against Montrose, only losing by 18 points. But their problem is they just don't kick enough goals. They're only averaging 10 goals a game. And only once this season they've kicked over 100 points. And that was 123 against bottom side Upper Ferntree Gully. Look, their inside forward 50s are OK. They just don't convert when they get the ball down there because of the lack of a big key forward. And they rely heavily on Wayne McInerney to do the job. But Evergreen Russell Cole and Hayden Schroeder, along with Daniel Rajab, Ryan Hanley, plus captain coach Neil Winterton, they're their prime movers, and Mulgrave have to shut them down if they want to win the game. Ryan James would be very disappointed at last week's effort up against uh, Upper Ferntree Gully in, a ve- in very tough conditions, and Mulgrave rely heavily on the run of Adam G, Dean Sekoulis, and Jamer and Knowles, and they will need big Seb Henderson, Alan Clevin, uh, Luke Parker, and Dale Cheeseman at their best if they're going to have any chance tomorrow. But look, but I think the Waters will get the points done in the end in a 15-point ball game. I think you've uh, pumped the Waters up a fair bit there and given a fair old slap to Mulgrave and then you've only announced a 15-point margin. Because I think the conditions are going to be very heavy. That uh, ground down at Mulgrave doesn't hold the water very well. I oh, didn't, uh, didn't see you saying any of this to Ryan James on the huddle on Wednesday night. <laughs> oh, well, you know me. <laughs> Division 2, done and dusted, gentlemen. Five great games. As you go local for your football tomorrow, expect at least three of those five matches to be very, very close. But it's Division 1 time, the Premier Division, brought to you by Inside Football. The must-read for the fan income footy fan, available also on iPhones and your iPads. Starting us off is Mitchell Wood, East Burwood, sitting on the bottom of the ladder, take on Noble Park. This is out at East Burwood Reserve, one way you would think. Most definitely. East Burwood season, uh, it's going from bad to worse. The Rams are winless and have just come off a 96-point loss to Scoresby. If they lose this week against Noble Park, it will be their 10th loss in a row. The Bulls would be hurting from their 8-point loss at the hands of Bullwin over the Queen's birthday long weekend. There's no doubt that they'll be looking for a big victory to increase their percentage and make ground on Norwood and Lillydale. Huge games are expected from Craig Anderson, Tim Kelly and the exciting Brett Dorr if the Bulls want to win comfortably. Meanwhile, East Burwood will be aiming to play four consistent quarters of football and give young forward Jaden Dooman every opportunity to finish in front of goal. There are a number of young players in the Rams side and although they may struggle against the experience of Noble Park, it will undoubtedly benefit them in the future. I really hope East Burwood are competitive, though the class and poise of the Bulls should see them prevail easily. Damo, how do you see the game happening out at Morton Park tomorrow? Blackburn take on Norwood. Norwood mm. are nicely positioned in the top five yep. in fourth spot. And Blackburn have given side scares and they've won some good games against some good sides this year, but they've sort of fallen off recently. Oh, they have in the past six weeks. And look, this is a vital contest for both sides. I feel that Blackburn have been disappointing in recent weeks. They haven't registered a victory since round four. It's a long time, isn't I it? I know, it is. And we haven't witnessed that same verve, which was evident early in the season from the Panthers. And that was characterised by a five-goal loss to Lilydale last week a margin which flattered Blackburn given they conceded six goals in the first term and failed to score any majors themselves prior to quarter time. If the sides can if the side rather can lift their intensity and work ethic in front of their home crowd at Morton Park with players such as Jared Warsterling and Ryan Tui contributing efficiently, then Blackburn is a chance. But conversely, Norwood returned to form last week with an impressive twenty seven point victory over Roville in a low scoring encounter, and it was a significant confidence booster for the club after enduring defeats in the previous two rounds at the hands of the intimidating Noble Park and Baldwin and this is a must win game for the Norsemen if they believe they can rise to the ranks of a premiership contender in Division 1 Alexander Calder, Stuart Hill and David Trotter were in superlative form for Norwood last week and they are influences that the Blackburn side must curb but I don't think the Panthers will be effective in doing so and they'll experience a hiding I believe from Norwood tomorrow afternoon a hiding, so is that a 10 goal plus margin or are we talking more of a 100? Uh, probably 10 goal plus margin. I'll stay a little bit conservative. Yeah, stay with the safe <laughs> option. Probably the wise decision. First place, Baldwin, undefeated Baldwin, taking all before them in season 2013. Welcome, Knox, 
out to SEN Park. Ray Baird, Knox trying to keep their season alive. Yeah, look, undefeated Tigers. They take on the Falcons at Cherry Road tomorrow. Look, this will be a daunting task for Knox. Taking on the rain in premiers and undefeated in 2013. On top of that, they've had a week's rest as well. Last week, it couldn't get any tougher for Knox. I've said it before. John Knight relishes this type of challenge and will not take a backward step. What else can one say about Baldwin, though? Look, they're firing on all cylinders. Luke Barker is in great form, plus now they have Blake Broadhurst up forward as well. Add Ryan McMahon, Steve Kenner, Milhausen, Goldsack, and the list goes on. But Knox, look, they were back on the winner's list last week over East Ringwood at East Ringwood, which is always hard to win out there. And Joel McGowan, he's in fantastic form, along with Simon Jeffrey, Liam Kidd, Shane Saunders, and Captain Luke Williams shows us each week why Star. he was in Frosty's top 50. But look, I just don't think that Knox have enough class to get all the strength to match it with the bigger body ball inside. The Tigers by 75 for mine. Ooh, 75, Ray Baird. East Ringwood aside that you mentioned just a moment ago, take on Vermont Mitch. It's eighth versus second. East Ringwood have been in some good form over the last month. They fell down last week, whereas Vermont, well, they've just surged to second spot on the ladder. Yeah, well, to put it simply, East Ringer, they must win this game against Vermont if they want to play mm-hmm. finals this season. Uh, we'll see the Roos playing coach Bernie Deneen front up with his former team in this crucial clash. Uh, Vermont's 79-point win over South Croydon was their second or seventh consecutive win, and they sit comfortably in second position behind Baldwin. East Ringwood fell short by two goals to a determined Knox outfit last week, and it has proved costly since they are now three wins and six losses in eight spot. Their defence will need to be fully alert for the whole game as the Eagles have many avenues to goal and have the best points for in the competition. A main priority for the Roos will be trying to nullify Justin Van Noonan. He has been in excellent form of late, kicking 18 goals in the last three weeks and 34 for the season. East Ringwood will need Cameron Purdy and Mitchell Farmer to lift in the forward half and must make the most of their opportunities. Vermont hasn't been troubled for several weeks now and they should be too strong for the Roos tomorrow afternoon. Very interesting clash out at Cheon Park. South Croydon take on Scoresby. It's 11th versus 10th. These sides are virtually the same amount of points for the year. They've defended away the basically the exact same amount of points for the year. Is this game all about bragging rights now? Are they still in this relegation sort of zone? And where the winner definitely isn't, the loser probably stays in. Well, yeah, this will be merely a battle for some much needed respectability between these two camps, as it will be difficult to see either side figuring in September. I think that's been decided already. And South Croydon have been unable to recapture their early season form, and their predicament was highlighted last week after they faltered by 79 points to the imposing Vermont side. The Bulldogs will be relying upon Daniel King, Daniel Coglin, and Blair Allen, who tried valiantly last weekend with three goals whilst accumulating plenty of possessions. That was the latter. And on the other side of the spectrum, Scoresby would have gained plenty of optimism after dismantling the lowly East Burwood by 96 points last weekend, and they need to display some of that vigour tomorrow. Magpies such as Stephen Scott, Brad Jones, and Jarrett Hicks, who converted a bag of five goals last week should figure prominently tomorrow against South Croydon and I feel that Scoresby can register their fourth victory of the season with a team lifting away wing at Cheong Park tomorrow. You know what I'm going to ask you? Five goals. Five goals is the margin for Scoresby and the sixth and final game in Division 1 tomorrow. Game number 22 of 22, but it's EFL's match of the day on 98.1 Radio Eastern is streaming live on EFL.org.au. Is Roval taking on Lilydale out at Knox Gardens Reserve, Ray? Try and keep your Roval scarf off in this one, will you? Yeah, look, I've named this Feather Fury at Knox Gardens Reserve <laughs> tomorrow. The Hawks play the Falcons of the Lilydale variety. Look, two sides, both setting their sights on that fifth spot come September. Roval have surpassed all expectations so far this season, but they are certainly eyeing off a win tomorrow. Cody Morris is in great form, leading the Division 1 goal kicking with 35. And along with Nathan Hicks, Michael Bussey, Alex Rawley, Mitch Garner and Matt Stanley, who are all now class Division 1 footballers, on their day, Roval believe that they can beat anybody. But tomorrow they come up against an informed Lilydale side, full of confidence, and now a side winning away from home. Simon Rourke has his mids working beautifully with Ben Waitman, Marcus Hotties, Ben Nagels and Ashraf Davies getting supply from James Roach and Andrew Borden at the stoppages. 
Although I believe that the Breeze brothers have left and gone overseas on holidays. Now, if this is true, that's going to leave a huge hole in the Lilydale side. And I think that the young Roval side will continue their undefeated run at Knox Gardens Reserve this season. The Hawks by 10 points for mine. Sure to be a great game out at Knox Gardens Reserve. And as we've already said, it is the EFL's match of the day on 98.1 Radio West and streaming live on EFL.org.au. Really appreciate the time you boys have taken out of your busy schedules. Well, Ray, you're pretty much retired and these other boys, well, they're young, pretty virtually uni students. But nonetheless, we've had a lot of fun in here at EFL House. Damien Watson, always love talking football with your good self. Yes, uh, pleasure to be here, BWS. Love talking footy with you too. And of course, you'll be looking after the uh, well the whole day on Radio Eastern tomorrow afternoon, including the uh, well the much anticipated, the much loved BCG post match show. Yeah, looking forward to it. Five o'clock on Saturday or tomorrow afternoon on Radio Eastern. And your perfect wingman on most Saturdays is Mitchell Wood, who joined us also today in the EFL house, mate. Thanks for coming in. Have a good day playing tomorrow, and uh, we'll definitely catch you on the airwaves in the afternoon. Yeah, no worries, uh, Ben. It was great to be here this afternoon. And, uh, yeah, I'll be around the grounds for the Churnside Park Warrandyke game, so it should be a beauty. To Ray Baird, we'll see you on Sunday morning. You'll be out of the game tomorrow. We'll probably have, have you on a pre-match if you're, if you're actually up for it, but you'll probably be hanging around with your old Roval cronies, won't you? Well, what do you mean cronies, mate? They're Cron- Roval supporters. <laughs> oh, it's, when, when, well, I wasn't going to call them your harem, was I? <laughs> no, that's true. And look, it's great to have done a Friday preview. And look, I love the work of the young boys too, mate. Oh, they they make they make us uh, they make us look terrible in the end, don't they? Well, they make you look terrible, but I sound <laughs> all right. <laughs> Great stuff, guys! This has been the Friday preview for another week. Hope you've enjoyed it. Of course, it was being brought to you by Inside Football, the must read for the fair Dinkum footy fan. We're out of here. It's beer o'clock, and as a wise man once said, "Stick, Stick a fork in this. We're, we're done." done.